Central Park is the first public park in America and still one of the most beautiful, loved and enjoyed by millions of people every year. Where else can you spend a day doing everything from playing ball <laughs> to hearing an impromptu concert, seeing and smelling flowers, some of which Shakespeare wrote about, riding a carousel, picnicking, looking at an obelisk from ancient Egypt, rowing a boat across a lake whose surface reflects trees, clouds, and skyscrapers, climbing a boulder, or a life-size sculpture of characters from Alice in Wonderland, bird watching, <laughs> exploring a castle, then lounging in the grass, all just a subway ride away, and all for free. I see Central Park in its unity and variety as an important work of art. It illustrates the principle, which is at the basis of my work as an architect, stated by Eli Siegel. All beauty is a making one of opposites, and the making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. And tonight, I'll show that the way this park puts reality's opposites together is beautiful, the way a painting or a piece of music is beautiful. And further, that through the knowledge of aesthetic realism, it can be useful to our very lives. One, oneness and manyness, unity and variety. In his 15 questions, is beauty the making one of opposites, Mr. Siegel asks, Is there in every work of art something which shows reality as one, and also something which shows reality as many and diverse? Must every work of art have a simultaneous presence of oneness and manyness, unity and variety? Just as these opposites were fundamental to the democratic foundation of our country, as stated in the Latin motto, E Pluribus Unum, from many, one. They were fundamental to the original vision for a central park for New York City, had by its designers Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox. As Olmsted explained, Central Park was to have, quote, all classes largely represented with a common purpose, each individual adding by his mere presence to the pleasure of all others, all helping to the greater happiness of each. In the mid-1800s, most New Yorkers labored long, hard hours, lived in crowded, stifling tenement houses, and unlike the rich, couldn't afford the time or money to vacation in the country. The park designers sought to create a feeling of the country in the city, a place where workers and their families could come to refresh their bodies and minds. The tremendous achievement of Vox and Olmsted is that the park they created encourages this kind purpose through its thoughtful design and centrally through the way it puts together oneness and manyness. A seemingly insurmountable obstacle facing the designers was the fact that city officials stipulated that the two and a half mile long tract of land they assembled would have to be subdivided by four cross streets to allow horse and buggy traffic to cross east and west unimpeded. These streets, 67th, 79th, 86th and 96th would have, in effect, made for five small parks, not one large park, with the rural feeling the designers wanted. And for park goers, getting from one parcel to another would have been hazardous. But Vox and Olmsted came up with the imaginative idea of ramping the streets below the level of the park and placing park roadways and paths atop wide bridges planted with abundant trees, shrubs, and plants. They wanted to make the cross streets scarcely noticeable to park goers, creating the feeling of one unified park arising from the five sections, enabling people to freely traverse unimpeded from 59th Street all the way to 110th if they liked, 
and they succeeded. After 166 years of growth, the vegetation hides the road so well, you can be unaware that cars and taxis are actually speeding by a few yards away. And that little dot in the middle of that slide, which I took from the top one of the bridges, is one of those taxis. You can hardly see it. The park itself is composed of many distinct parts, each with its own unique character. Yet these flow into one another with no distinct boundaries. For example, starting at the southeast corner of the park, you can stroll around the rustic pond. Promenade the length of the stately mall under towering elms. Descend the grand staircase of the elegant Bethesda Terrace. Cross the boat-busy lake atop Bow Bridge. Skirt the wild, thickly wooded ramble. Pass the sunny, expansive Great Lawn. Circle around the reservoir. Cross the North Meadow to the formal conservatory gardens. And end at the bucolic Harlem Mere in the northeast corner. Yet with all this variety, you feel it's a continuous experience, with every element adding to the next, and all contained within one large, neat, 843-acre rectangle, right in the middle of America's largest metropolis. The opposites of oneness and manyness, unity and variety, which Central Park puts together so well, are also opposites every person wants to make sense of, in ourselves. I was fortunate to learn about this in an aesthetic realism lesson I had with Mr. Siegel in 1978. Like most people, I felt there were many different aspects, many different things going on in my life, but with little sense of coherence among them. I was a son, a brother, a roommate. I was an architect and a trustee at the church I attended. I cared for music, particularly Beethoven, and I had just begun to date a young woman, Barbara Bueller, who I'm happy to say has been my wife now for over 30 years. Mr. Siegel asked me this surprising question. What relation do you think Beethoven has to architecture? Uh, well, I think he has a beautiful relation of freedom and order that good architecture has too. Do you think that every composition in music is, in a sense, a construction? Yes. There's a going for something organized. And you are an organization? Not as well organized as I could be. The large thing in organization is many things working as one. Do you believe right now all of your body is working as one? There's a relation between your toes and your eyes, also between your fingers and your toes. I learned that what has a person feel truly composed and unified is using the different aspects of our lives for one purpose, our largest purpose, which aesthetic realism explains is to light the world. With all its confusion and injustice, the world can honestly be light because it has an aesthetic structure. The fact that everything is composed of opposites, like oneness and manyness, rest and motion, hardness and softness, inside and outside, means that we are not only different from everyone else, as I have once felt, we are also related. The way the various elements of Central Park add to each other then shows how we want to be and how we need to see people different from ourselves with the respect and kindness they deserve. Two, how Central Park began, private and public. The idea of public parks originated in 18th century England, where landscaping was designed for great country estates that put together formal and informal, planned and natural elements. In the 1840s and 50s, a group of visionary New Yorkers felt that a large green open space like these was greatly needed, not in the country for the exclusive use of a privileged few, but right here, in this densely built up, rapidly growing city, convenient for all its citizens to enjoy. Among these advocates were William Cullen Bryant, poet and newspaper editor, and Andrew Jackson Downing, an American landscape designer 
who was inspired by visits to London's extensive parks. Through their work and others, the New York State Legislature in 1853 authorized the city to purchase land to develop a park. Another early supporter of the park was to become one of its designers, Calvert Vaux. Vaux, who lived from 1824 to 1895, was a London-born architect and landscape designer who immigrated to the U.S. He opened an office in New York, and over the next 40 years designed for this city, he loved and called home some of its most notable landmarks, including Jefferson Market Courthouse, now the Greenwich Village branch of the New York Public Library, which he designed with Frederick Withers, the original buildings of the Metropolitan Museum, and the Museum of Natural History, designed with Jacob Mould, the National Arts Club on Gramercy Park, and 10 Homes for Orphaned Boys, designed with George Radford for the Children's Aid Society. While Vox was pleased New York would finally get a public park, he was rightly critical of the formal design proposed by Egbert Veal, the engineer who was appointed to plan the park. A design in which the four transverse streets I spoke about were shown cutting through and, in his opinion, ruining the park. With others, Vox successfully urged officials to hold an open competition to elicit and select the best design. At this time, when landscape design was not even recognized as a profession, let alone taught, Vox, who had previously worked as a landscape designer with Andrew Jackson Downing, was one of the most capable persons for this task. But rather than arrogantly feel he could do it alone, he sought out a partner to work with him, criticize him, and add to him. He found that person in Frederick Law Olmsted. 1822 to 1903, a farmer and journalist who had been appointed superintendent of construction for the park some months before. While Olmsted had visited England and was impressed by the public parks there, he had no experience in landscape design. But Vox recognized his potential, and he respected Olmsted's passion about the land and about what people deserved expressed in two books he wrote about his travels through the South, including first-hand accounts of the horrors of slavery which he abhorred. Working evenings in Vox's home, the two men created what they call the Greensward Plan that won the competition and gave birth to a whole new art form that Vox would later call landscape architecture. Three, the kindness and ethics of Central Park. From today's perspective, it's hard to conceive how revolutionary Central Park was. In the 1850s, there were virtually no large public parks in American cities. The very idea that in the middle of this fast-growing city of banking and commerce, a huge parcel of prime real estate, the size of 153 city blocks, was to be owned not by individuals, to build tenements and factories for their personal profit, but by and for the use of every New Yorker, including the poorest. This was astonishing to most people and infuriating to many, for it profoundly challenged what some saw as the cherished right of private ownership at a time when profit economics, epitomized by entrepreneurs such as Cornelius Vanderbilt and John Jacob Astor, was approaching its zenith. I believe Central Park and every public park to follow is part of what Eli Siegel explained in 1970. It is the force of ethics in the world that was bringing to an end what he called the much touted mode of American industry, that toughest, most inconsiderate of activities, unquote, in which the majority of people work to make money for a few. He showed that an economy based on profit is inherently unjust because it encourages people's contemptuous desire to own the world rather than to know it. As Mr. Siegel explains in his book, Self and World, quote, the possessor has felt it was more important to feel that a tree was owned by him than to feel that he knew what that tree was and what it could mean. And he has let the ownership of a tree or grass or a field 
take the place of being fully affected by these things in nature. The artist has been forced to possess, forced to compete, but as artist, he was not after possession or competition. He did not feel that his own strength depended on his having what he did not want other people to have. He has come to power by undergoing the might of things and giving them form through his personality." Unquote. Olmsted and Vox's desire to know and be affected by the land of this tract of Manhattan Earth and by what the people of New York deserve inspire them to give the land a new, beautiful, and kind form. They wrote in an 1866 report, which has been called a landmark in the literature of the American park movement. Quote, the purpose of a public park is to provide a place where townspeople can regain the energy they had expended in labor. For without the recuperation of force, the power of each individual to add to the wealth of the community is also soon lost. And they describe what such a park must offer. <coughs> Quote, Pastoral scenery, consisting of combinations of trees, standing singly or in groups, and casting their shadows over broad stretches of turf, or repeating their beauty by reflection upon the calm surface of pools. The predominant associations are in the highest degree tranquilizing and grateful, as expressed by the Hebrew poet, quote, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters." Unquote. This is beautiful. The designers had a conviction that hardworking people would be strengthened, both rested and energized, by experiencing trees standing singly and in groups, solid turf and reflective waters. This points to the opposites of repose and energy, one and many, firmness and yieldingness, and to what aesthetic realism would explain 100 years later, that seeing opposites together in the world can have these same opposites more composed in ourselves, making us stronger and happier. Four, sameness and change, firmness and flexibility. Many people think that Central Park is largely natural, that, as the famous New York journalist Horace Greeley said on seeing it for the first time, it's good they left it alone. <laughs> but if Vox and Olmsted had left the land north of 59th Street as they found it, instead of this vista, we would have this. That's an actual photograph taken in the area of Bethesda Terrace. Hard as it is to believe, Central Park is more a work of art than a product of Mother Nature and one that called for tremendous effort and made for tremendous change. Some of what this took in, I'm grateful to have learned from my colleague, consultant and urban planner, John Stern. He wrote, for instance, that in Olmsted's role as construction superintendent, he mobilized a workforce that numbered hundreds of men who cleared away refuge dumps, dredged swamps, and moved tons of earth and rock excavating not only for the submerged cross streets, but for miles of drainage pipe. They filled in and prepared the soil, built bridges as we see here, and park structures, laid down pathways and roads, and planted thousands of trees, shrubs, and plants on this largely barren site, and all according to the Greenswood plan. However, the designers didn't arrogantly change everything writes Mr. Stern, quote, they carefully studied and worked with the topography and existing elements of the site, leaving, for instance, many of the magnificent rock outcroppings and rugged terrain intact as natural features. Simultaneously, they softened the effect of the rocks through introducing lakes and ponds, meandering walks, and a rich variety of plantings much of which was planned by the renowned Austrian landscape designer, Ignaz Pilar. The result is what Mr. Siegel called a planned wilderness that is both natural and urbane, rugged and people friendly at once." Unquote. Five, a friendship based on kindness and criticism saves the park. 
Central Park was an immediate popular success. Yet from its inception, Vox and Olmsted had to fight against politicians, budget cuts, and demands for changes that threatened the integrity and kindness of the park, including proposals to, one, eliminate the expensive excavation work needed to lower the crosstown roads. Two, close the dairy, pictured here, that Vox had designed where poor children got milk and toys to play with and converted to into a money-making restaurant. And three, allow the construction of mansions on the park side of Fifth Avenue, then a horse racing track, and even a world's fair. Tired of fighting these demands of the rich and powerful and unwilling to compromise further, the partners finally resigned their positions in 1863. While Vox pursued other commissions in the city, his passion about the welfare of the park, to which he once said, I devoted the very heart of my life, never dimmed. How hurt he was then whenever Olmsted, who had been more in the public eye as park superintendent, but who was now managing a failing gold mine operation in California, was often given sole credit for its design. Then in 1866, Vox got a great opportunity to use his passion for how city land can be used. His ideas were sought for a new park being planned for Brooklyn, and what he proposed was brilliant. But rather than try to show up his former partner, he recalled how well they had worked together, bringing out good things in each other for the benefit of Central Park. And he encouraged him to return and renew their partnership. Olmsted, wary after his Central Park experience, was very hesitant. But Vox didn't give up. His persistence is a moving illustration of what it means to be kind. As Eli Siegel explains in his work, definitions and comment being a description of the world. Quote, kindness is that in a self which wants other things to be rightly pleased. The word rightly here is important. I used to tell myself that I was kind when I gave compliments or flattered people, or just agreed with them, even if I hadn't paid attention to what they said. <laughs> Meanwhile, the crucial matter of really trying to know another person, being interested in how they see other people and things, what is affecting them, and what would have them rightly pleased, was simply not in my mind. Like most people, I was too busy thinking about myself. This, I learned, isn't kindness, it's contempt, which Mr. Siegel once described as the difference between what something deserves and what we choose to give. And he writes further in the comment to his definition of kindness. To be kind is honestly to think of what another person or other persons truly desire. If we do not take the trouble to find this out or do not want to take the trouble, our kindness is so much not kindness. I'm very grateful for what I've learned on this subject, including the crucial fact that one of the kindest things one person can do for another is to be critical of what in a person weakens him or her. I think this is what impelled Calvin Vox to write letter after letter to his friend, Frederick Law Olmsted, urging him to return to New York and to the best thing in him, his desire to shape the earth for the good of the people. In one letter he wrote about the art, landscape architecture they were pioneering. Quote, for us to be the means of elevating an unaccredited but important pursuit seems to me a direct contribution to the best interests of humanity, a task that is possible together, impossible alone. I feel that it will be a burning shame and a reprehensible mistake on our part if Central Park slips up as a confused jumble of which there is nothing quotable as precedent that will help our successors." Unquote. Finally, in August 1866, Olmsted returned to renew his partnership with Fox. And together, they designed the park now recognized as a masterpiece of urban park design. Prospect Park in Brooklyn, followed by Riverside Park, Morningside Park, Fort Greene Park, among some dozen others, 
and Central Park itself, on which they worked in various capacities for the rest of Box's life. Said Olmsted years later, were it not for his invitation, I should have been a farmer. <laughs> Six, the structures of Central Park assertive and yielding. A common mistake people make is to feel it's weak, yielding to other people and things. That to take care of yourself, you have to be assertive, have your way. In doing so, however, we often feel mean and cold. I certainly did. But as Mr. Siegel writes in Self and World, art shows these opposites don't have to fight. Quote, through merging with things, the artist has deeply been controlled by them. He has come to power by undergoing the might of things and giving them form through his personality, unquote. Providing rich evidence for this are the dozens of imaginatively designed bridges, pavilions, and arbors that Calvert Vox designed throughout Central Park. These structures don't assert themselves or the architect's ego in competition with their natural surroundings, but rather seem inspired by them, thus joining with the landscape as if they had always been there. From this whimsical branch-like shelter and this charming rustic bridge, to the grandeur of the terrace staircase with its ebullient leafy carvings by Jacob Mould, from Belvedere Castle that seems to rise out of the rock, to Vox's masterpiece, the sublime Bow Bridge. See how low and lovingly it hugs the earth, even as it effortlessly leaps across the lake like the most graceful deer, strong, dignified, and proud in its relation to the world that is both around it and through that arching line of circular, sun-dappled openings within it. By undergoing the might of things, Vox got to his most powerful expression, which is all the greater for its simple eloquence. <laughs> Central Park will surely continue to attract New Yorkers and visitors from around the world for many years to come. And while people will seek its fields, flowers, and lakes as an idyllic retreat, from office pressures and crowded, noisy streets, the park's crags and thorns, and reflections of office towers in its lakes should remind us that Central Park is a part of, not a part from, the rest of the world, and related to everything through the opposites. I think Calvert Box and Frederick Law Olmsted would want their creation to be a means of people seeing all reality more accurately and kindly, something aesthetic realism now makes possible. This will truly add, as Olmsted wrote, to the pleasure of all and the greater happiness of each. Oh.